have to say that the more I researched this presentation, the more I realized just how complicated a history uh, the subject has. I'll be bouncing back and forth between um, art and science and treating them much the same because um, when, we de when we're discussing art and science uh, as a, um, when related to, to uh, faith, a lot of the same issues uh, kept coming up. As a medical media specialist, I'm sure that some of you have, um, when people have questioned you as to what you do, you tell them that you're an artist working in science, a renaissance person, they kind of look at you strangely. And if you're a person of faith, they would kind of have this thing in, on their face that says, I have to get you, save you from that career that you're, you're involved with. Um, that's happened to me a number of times over the years. The intersection of faith and science has been in the news for pa most of the past two centuries, and especially since the publication of Darwin's On the Origin of the Species. And faith in the arts has been in the, in the news for most of the last two millennia. Uh, we're now in an age of postmodernism, and according to J.I. Packer, who's a theologian at Regent College, the heart of postmodernism is parasitic. It has no life of its own. It has a life only by a denial of what other people believe. And while I've been thinking about the intersection of faith and arts and science for some time, the part of the idea uh, came from a talk on a, on a Facebook discussion I was having with a friend. When I posted an article by Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, I don't know how many of you know her, um, she is, among other things, the director of the Climate Science Center at Texas Tech University in Lubbock. She's the wife of Andrew Farley, uh, an evangelical pastor of a large evangelical church in, in Lubbock. And she was also part of the President's Commission on Climate Change. If any of you saw President Obama um, when uh, discussing this on, um, on PBS, uh, Catherine was the redhead that was uh, sitting next to him. Um, and most important to, most of, to some of us is she's a Canadian. Um, <laughs> She's also a great, great communicator who has the gift of making science interesting and spends much of her time trying to reach the religious right. My friend, <laughs> this is her picture of herself. So it's, it's from a PBS um, series called Global Weirding. I would advise anyone who's interested to, to check it out. It's a, uh, it's a Facebook online um, uh, series. My friend said he didn't believe in climate change. He's reiterated this a number of times since, because the only science he believes in is what he can read in the Bible. Um, I should have quoted Revelation, where it says, the time has come to judge the dead and to destroy those who destroy the world. But what I'll do today is agree with Jay Holman, an adjunct professor in medicine at Louisiana State University who wrote in the book When Science Meet and, and God Meet, which is published by the Evangelical Fellowship uh, in Association in the, in the US. I'm equally skeptical of those who try to read scripture as a science text and atheists who claim that science proves there is no God. Another thing that sparked this talk was an exhibition at the Art Gallery of Ontario from the end of 2016 to 2017 called Mystical Landscapes. It was a collaboration with Musée d'Orsay in Paris, and if anybody wants to see it in Paris, if they go hop on a plane right now, they may be able to catch it before it ends tomorrow. Um, in her introduction to the exhibit, curator Catherine Lachlan stated that since the end of the 16th century age of reason, the enlightenment had, that ushered in our secular age, the sciences, with increasing sophistication, have taken the lead in physical exploration. Yet despite the best efforts of brilliant minds and scientific instruments, we are still unable to explain or comprehend the extent of the universe or the source and purpose of life. The artwork in the exhibit examined the artists who were interested in creating a new spiritual art. I've heard scientists say much the same thing. Mystical and spiritual experiences are often seen as religious, but much of modern religion has little to do with the mystical or even faith, it has more to do with ritual. And as such, anything outside the box is seen as a danger to belief. 
According to C.S. Lewis, the problem is that we are so given to factualizing truth that it is practically impossible for us to hear God. So why is there friction between the arts, science, and faith in a postmodern world? And what do we find in the intersection of science, art, and faith? The three disciplines capture different areas of our lives. In science, we learn how. <clears throat> in, um, in art, we learn who. And in faith, we learn why we are. Sadly, most of the dialogue we hear about art and science and faith is happening between relatively fringe groups. Come on, there we go. Um, we live in an area of Toronto that has been a magnet for new immigrants. And the grade school my daughter went to has a strong music program. One day my wife came home from school and said that there was a problem with part of the music program. Music's prohib prohibited by Muslims. Well, as being a fan of Yusuf Islam, also known as Cat Stevens, and having lived in Saudi Arabia for two years, I knew that this was not true. What I didn't realize is that some of the Muslims who were living in our area from a fundamental, fundamentalist branch of Islam that prohibits all art. So, science has been reduced to evolution versus young earth creation, and climate change pro or con, and art is a family values issue against artists who push, push established standards. In a recent essay, How the Religious Right <clears throat> Pioneered Propaganda as News, Terry Heaton, who was the executive producer of the 700 Club in the 1980s, <coughs> writes, let me be clear, the right wing news that we created was a political response to the progressive nature of news and information. It was politically motivated to move, it was a politically motivated move to co-opt religious conservatives into a far-right political agenda that included a move to defund the NEA. According to Reagan biographer Craig Shirley, there's been, there has long been a perception that a lot of liberal causes and a lot of liberal art was being promoted by the NEA. Piss Christ by Catholic artist Andreas Serrano and the posthumous Ma Robert Maplethorpe res retrospective, The Perfect Moment, were both indirectly funded by the NEA. And even though Serrano was a practicing Catholic, the right pounced on both of these exhibits as examples of a sinister agenda within the liberal left. Today, we're likely to see this in movies like The Last Temptation of Christ or uh, Beauty and the Beast, which had a gay character and the demonstrations against um, organizations or against the, the movie theaters because it is against our, our values. The Impressionists saw a spiritual element to their art, art that expressed the reality of the human condition. Now, this isn't an Expressionist uh, painting, obviously. It's um, Titian's version of Urbano, and she is dre dreamily gazing into the distance. Um, and it was the type of art that people in the establishment thought was quite proper and quite OK. Monet, Manet sorry, uh, painted Olympia, a nude reclining from her bed but looking at the viewer with disdain. Much more ordinary scene. And the painting needed guards at its first showing to keep its detractors from damaging it. Historian Richard Hochstetter in the 1966 book Anti-Intellectualism in American Life described how the spread of fundamental evangelicalism since the 18th century has fostered the notion that education, at least post-secondary education, is an obstacle to faith. And since the late 19th century, rather than reasoned debate, the word warfare has been at times used to describe the relationship between religious and science, and also at times the relationship between art and science. But the conflict is an echo of an early, earlier era. Roger Martin, who I don't know how many of you know him, he's a, a prof at uh, U of T. He's uh, an American, but uh, well-known uh, author and management guru, stresses the need for us to be open to creative ideas. A design thinking organization is capable of effectively advancing knowledge from mystery to heuristic and algorithm, gaining a cost advantage over its competitors along the way. Art and science tends to flourish in centers of creativity. 
And creative people, whether they're artists or scientists, tend to question authority. They question orthodox beliefs, or at least they push the boundaries to prove the concept. While useful in all areas of life, the openness to ideas can lead to a disruption in orthodox thought and defensiveness in the establishment. Tom Nichols, in the preface to his book, The Death of Expertise, writes, I'm used to people disagreeing with me. In fact, I encourage it. Principled, informed arguments are a sign of intellectual health and vitality in a democracy. In this case, it's Bill Nye, the science guy, talking with Ken Ham, the CEO and founder of Answers in Genesis, having a debate about the origins of life. In Judaism and Christianity, an objection to visual art can be found in the Ten Commandments. A plain reading of the text, the idea that visual art is sinful, can be seen in the Torah and what the Christians call the Pentateuch. In Islam, the Quran has, similar, uh, has a similar command. But in the Hadith, um, which is a uh, report of the sayings of Muhammad, Muhammad said that all Im images should be destroyed. We can see with some justification the prohibition of visual art among fundamentalists. However, the real command is that we should not worship idols. It wasn't about images per se. Scriptural texts prohibit only the making and worshiping of images of the divine. And while the text forbids idolatry, there's an awareness that not all images are idolatrous. Idolatry is also forbidden in Sikhism and other religions. Although, of course, some faith groups such as Buddhists and Hindus do use idols in their, in their worship. But while we look through history, we can see how the visual arts were an essential part of many of the faith traditions. While Islamic art was mostly focused on calligraphy, visual art was part of Christianity from its earliest roots. And the Spirit of God filled the artists and craftspeople with skill to do every sort of work when the Israelites built the tabernacle of Moses. The art of the catacombs, which dates back to at least the second century, is, in part, is part instructional and part symbolic. It was used to teach illiterate Romans the gospel. Wall art was used in the synagogue as, as in the church. Characters from the scriptures were painted on the walls of both the church and, in this case, the synagogue in Dua Europa, Syria, which was destroyed in the third century AD. And this is where they're explaining that you shouldn't be using idols and the, the golden calf that the uh, Israelites made when Moses was up the mountain. Much of the art of the first millennium was religious art. Mosaics and some frescoes from the Roman period survived, and by the second century, much of this art was Christian. Christian communities survived the early persecution because they offered a more satisfying combination of spiritual and communal life than the mystery religions of the East. In this fresco, believed to be from the sixth century of St. Paul and St. Thecla, a female disciple of Paul from a cave near Ephesus. In his book on the strange pace of religion in contemporary art, art historian and critic James Elkins writes that for some people, art is simply religious, whether artists admit it or not. Art is inescapably religious, so it is said, because it expresses such things as the hope in the transcendence or the possibilities of the human spirit. Much of the religious ethics taught in the Middle Ages came from Platonic or Aristotelian philosophy, but the Judeo-Christian Islamic faiths were much more modest people than the ancient Greeks, and this was reflected in their art. Art was part of the church through the Dark Ages, and, through and into the Middle Ages in Catholic Europe. The decoration of churches continues to this day. While much of the secular art is lost, we can still find portraits and landscapes. But by the Renaissance, religious and secular art, especially in, in Italy, was in a golden age with Raphael, Donatello, Michelangelo da Vinci, and dozens of, others mas of dozens of other masters working under the umbrella of the Catholic Church. At the same time, the develop, uh, development of the Bible in the vernacular led to a change in the way people looked up at Christianity or looked at Christianity. Two Catholic priests from Northern Europe were stirring up the populace with their sermons and writings. Erasmus of Rotterdam claimed that Christianity comes in two versions: 
Formalistic Christianity concerned only with the physical rituals and outward show, and a Christianity of the spirit that takes that taken seriously the words and spirit of Jesus, but is unconcerned with what Erasmus called silly little ceremonies. And of course, German priest and philosopher, theologian Martin Luther, who according to his superior confessor, Johann van Stupitz, seemed to turn every fart into a sin. <laughs> he dove into the scriptures condemning the Roman Catholic concept of indul indulgences. He embraced St. Paul's writings of justification by faith and again promoted an internal faith rather than a, an external ritual. Erasmus and Luther lived at the height of the Renaissance in Italy. When Luther visited Rome at the same time Michelangelo was painting the Sistine Chapel, he was scandalized by the way the Italians, especially the clergy, lived. Much of this, how much of this affected the Protestant vision of art, we'll never know. But we do know that over the next few years of the Reformation, various Protestant groups, under the lead, teaching of leaders such as John Calvin, banned art from worship in the churches. They painted over frescoes and in some cases destroyed the stained glass windows. Luther was not opposed to art, to images in the church, except where they became an idol. And neither Calvin nor Luther were against art itself. In, indeed, Calvin uh, felt that art was something that was given from God. Religious themes were common among artists up to and throughout the 19th century, although the subject was handled differently. In France, religious, mythological, and heroic art in the romantic style of the academy was acceptable for our, all artists, such as Ingres and Delacroix, to paint nudes and images that as part of a modern scene might seem lewd. They could also paint commissions such as this on the walls of the churches of France. For many postmodern artists and historians, the idea that art could be expressing any level of spiritual faith is an anathema. And for some of them, the teaching of faith in their childhood became the source of the angst uh, that drove their art. Just because you have a religious subject does not mean you have a spiritual subject. In fact, according to Elkins, if we use the concept of institutional art, the art exhibited in galleries and museums, it does say something about the content of the art because it excludes almost all art that is openly religious. He also comments that most art that is, uh, modern art that is painted as religious art is not very good. Um, when the realists and impressionists first exhibited their work, they were rejected by the French establishment. The art was considered childish or ugly. It was not generally a spiritual thing, it was a power dynamic. According to Elkins, the first generation of abstract painters, for example, were full of spiritual and religious enthusiasms. Current scholarship on Mondrian, whose painting Tableau One is seen here, uh, Malkovec, Kodinsky, and others tends not to fo focus on their theosophy or their mystical beliefs as much, on, as much as their philosophic theories and the senses of history. But in America, where the evangelical church is powerful, the issue was modernism. Evangelical churches were splitting between fundamentalists and modernists. Fundamentalists wanted to fight what they saw as a decline in spirituality, and they saw the modern art and the modern science as issues that were leading to the decline. This was mirrored in other faiths as fundamentalist groups in many religious traditions rebelled against the march of the modern world. Art that is explicitly anti-religious is condemned by religious commentators, while art that treats it with credibility However, sincerely religious art is ignore, ignored by both groups. How much of that's because it isn't very good, I don't know. And modern science would not exist without the concept of a creator God who set the world in motion. In the early pantheist and pagan religions, the gods controlled the fates. They fight in heaven and lighting, lightning bolts hit the world. Or the upset god of the underworld sets off earthquakes. The monotheistic group, Greek philosophers and their Jewish and Zoroastrian contemporaries led to the science that we have today. The first evidence of biomedical research was in a food-related experiment in the first chapter of the book of Daniel, where Daniel was asked the guard who was guarding him and three friends to test them for 10 days, give us nothing but 
vegetables and water to eat, and then compare our appearance with the young men who eat the royal food, and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. Many of the masters in science and art were people of faith. Newton, Mendel, da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Van Gogh were devout Christians. We don't hear that a lot for some of them. We hear about their excesses or whatever, but many Jews and Muslims were active in physics and astronomy from before it was considered a science in the West up until today. There are about seven million researchers in the world. They're experts in a variety of fields, as we see here every year, that impact us every day. About 1.3 million of these researchers are in the USA, and 50 to 60,000 postdocs do work in biomedical research. They're from all faiths and none. Francis Collins, in his book, The Language of God, writes that about 40% of scientists are, pe are people of faith. Fundamentalist literists are wary of experts and elites. They use their interpretation of their holy books to support their view. Many of them don't understand myth and spirituality. They look at the abortion debate, evolution, evolutionary biology, climate change, realism, surrealism, modern and postmodern art as, the set, as areas that diminish their faith. They're fixed in the physical world, not in the metaphysical world. And they see all questioning of their literal understanding of their faith as sin. Many in the faith community are taught to accept the teaching of their leaders without question. And those of us who play the devil's advocate in discussions of what we believe can be ostracized in some, in some communities. People on both sides of the faith debate can be judgmental. Megan Phillips Roper, a former member of Westboro Baptist Church in an NYC TED Talk given in January of this year, talks about breaking the world into us and them, only emerging from our bunkers to lob rhetorical grenades at the other camp. Uh, Catherine Hayhoe talks about the same thing, and I'm sure many of you have seen this in your, in your daily lives. Writing off the other side is left-wing liberal elites or racist misogynist bullies, and I haven't heard any talk about that this week here. Um, just to be clear that the, the uh, Renault the Renoir uh, uh, demo is being satirical. So we need to break off the attacks and talk to each other. Asking questions is important, whether we're talking about art, science, or faith. And it's important to note that there is a great deal of diversity, philosophical and political, among people of faith, and many theological conservatives are willing to question the prevailing community wisdom on matters not directly affecting theology. Pressure to accept a one-size-fits-all faith collapses when it comes against strenuous authority questioning, boundary pushing, environments of modern teaching. When your science prof is telling you that your belief system is fiction and your faith community is telling you that science is in love, the science you love is incompatible with their beliefs, who are you going to believe? However, the faults on both sides. The battles are not really being fought between science and faith, rather it's between atheism and faith, or moral issues and faith. Very few in the faith community reject the theory of gravity or flight or aeronomics or the <clears throat> inverse square law. We need to separate scientific issues from moral and political issues. Uh, Jeff K. Clark, senior editor and staff writer at Christian Week, which describes itself as Canada's only national interdenominational news publication wrote in October of last year that his approach to theology as a strict letter of the law type attitude caused him to become rigid. They left little room for viewpoints that seemed to color outside the lines. Any ideas that didn't fit into his system were judged to be in or out, right or wrong. In the article, he quoted Roger Olson, a professor of Christian theology of ethics at Baylor <coughs> University, Fundamentalists have a tendency towards harsh political rhetoric and angry denunciations or ad hominem arguments when writing about fellow evangelicals with whom they disagree. So even within the communities, there are these arguments. Mr. Clark then went on to admit, admit the error of his ways, which he described as a move from certainty to discovery. 
while this was written from a Christian perspective, I think we can agree that whenever ideological certainty supersedes a questioning mind, little good comes of it. This tangency to challenge science or art goes back centuries. We're all familiar with the papal con condemnation of Galileo for his support of Copernicus. And while they were eventually proven correct, simple observation told us that the sun revolves around the, the earth. While the church had previously accepted Copernicus's theory, they condemned Galileo for supporting the theory that he proved the physical evidence with the physical evidence of the telescope. Of course, a plain text reading of the Psalms will tell you that the sun really just pops out of a tent in the morning and pops back in at night. Galileo's problems were an example of the confirmation bias, evolution of some other theory was wrong because the Bible says it's wrong. It tells us how the world was made and the Bible's never wrong. Therefore, the Bible has proved science is wrong and then science is a crock. And of course, there's no proof of God in the natural world, therefore religion is a crock. People reject things that don't fit within their understanding of the world. In the death of expertise, author Tom Nichols writes, equal rights don't mean your opinion carries equal weight. He goes on to write that experts face a vexing challenge. There's more news available, and yet people are less, seem less informed, a trend that goes back at least a quarter century. Paradoxically, it is a problem that's worsening rather than dissipating. Not only do people know less about the world around them, they're less interested in it, despite the availability of more information than ever before. Healthy skepticism or resentment? Science or religion are in agreement that the universe and time as we know it began in an instant. How long ago is up for discussion? Some in the science community say that the creator is impossible because he can't happen within nature. German philosopher Rudolf Otto explores the phenomenology of encounters with the Holy Other in the 1920s, and his sense of the Holy was a supernatural reality. When the faithful look at a miracle, it is supernatural. That is, it's outside of nature. Neither they nor anyone else should see the supernatural as being constrained by nature. The faithful and the ag agnostic should be in complete agreement. Supernatural events, as anyone who has read Harry Potter knows, happen outside of natural law. You can believe in them or not, but science happens in the natural world and art happens in the creative world. Thank you. Thank you.